Good. So good to start. Okay. Sure. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mickey. Uh, thank you for being uh, being available. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so uh, the way I always start these is very straightforward. Uh, just where did you grow up and what was the night sky like where you were growing up? Oh, yeah. So I was born in Tokyo, Japan. And as you can see, it's a big city and, you know, night pollutions and stuff that there aren't that many stars. Um, and uh, let's see, but I was, uh, so from first grade to, I would say all the way to sixth grade, I went to Nagano, Japan, which uh, in 1998, there was a, a Olympics, Winter Olympics in Nagano. So it's the kind of middle of the mountain, right? Uh, so I I went there for a week at a time as a summer camp. And so uh, that's where I saw like a very beautiful, you know, starly night uh, sky. Uh, yeah, but other than that, in Tokyo is like pretty much, if I can see a Northern star, uh, that's that's great. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, yeah, with Tokyo, yeah, lucky to see anything. So did you, were you a, a fan of, like, science fiction growing up, or did you? Yeah. So what's interesting is that I, I, I don't remember when I started liking stars and uh, astronomy, but I'm always science inclined, right? So instead of... Um, like a literature, right? That people grew up with, <laughs> like stories and you know whatever else. Uh, I tend to gravitate towards science books. So like uh, I think there was a book about this Japanese scientist who um, studied snowflakes extensively. Or um, I also, if it was story, then it was like Greek mythology. Uh, or I remember reading um, like Stephen Hawking's book and uh, like a theory about space and universe, like from when I was very small. That was my reading. But I, I mean, I actually have to say I didn't like reading. But if I were to read, these are the books. <laughs> Excellent. You you were so this was you were growing up and you were reading like about a Japanese scientist that studied snowflakes for a living. Like, is this like a textbook or a biography or? I think it was a biography. I don't even remember who that was anymore. Ooh, okay. We'll, we'll find <laughs> out. Uh, maybe I'll um, check later. Well, and that's one of the things. So uh, one of the things that I always do is, you know, if anything's mentioned here, I'll do a little research afterwards yeah. because I know people would be fascinated. But yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so yep. do you do you remember when you're first like, oh, you know, maybe 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 space is kind of the, the part of science that you're kind of interested in? Yeah, so well, as I mentioned, I went to this summer school right in the mountain of Nagano, and I think I distinctly remember at uh, age of uh, seven, um, you know, I looked at this like star. That day was particularly beautiful, and you know, those I think pe some people have this moment where like you know the, the universe is so vast, and then I am so insignificantly little. Right, that like goosebump moment, right, happened to me in uh, when I was uh, seven years old, and that's I think it's the trigger when I started reading like Hawkins and um, Greek mythology and start studying about uh, Moon and Mars and you know solar system and Big Bang and all of that. I think that's that's the start. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. All right. So. I, I'm curious, did you just gravitate towards Greek mythology? Because I, I know Japan has an extensive mythology of its own. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh. but, you know, the Japanese adopted the Western, uh, I guess, the, you know, constellation system early mm -hmm. on so that all the uh, encyclopedia and whatnot are all, you know, like a, the Western type. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. So yeah. you you went you went to the sun you went to the summer school you're in uh, Nagano you're you know, seeing the glory of the cosmos ahead what, what were the next steps did you did you know that you wanted to be a scientist did you know you wanted to be a researcher from that day or did you have other divergences so I always let's see I had two interests mainly one is science right because of that 
you know, the stars and universe and whatnot, but the other is art. So um, let's see, uh, um, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I, I might be going a little too much ahead, but um <laughs> there, there's no there's no ahead okay. there's no behind this is a conversation okay. it's okay <laughs> got it got it uh, so um it's true that at one point i even mm -hmm. went to extensive like summer uh intensives for art um these are for for high school students who are trying to get into art schools because it's very competitive to get into art school in japan so i did that too uh, so I was pretty serious about going on art, uh, but at the same time, I was inclined to science. And the um, my school was private, girls-only Catholic school, <laughs> and then we weren't known for scientific excellence, <laughs> right? So I kind of knew that I have to probably go somewhere else to study science or art. Right. So I knew that I have to go through like um, what college entrance exam prep course or whatever, uh, you know, for that. Yeah. Uh, but what happened was at, uh, when I was 15, uh, Japanese first astronaut flew to space for the first time. And mm. that was a big, big deal. Right. And of course, the Japanese people will celebrate this occasion. And so um so there was lots of events happened, but one of them was an art contest. So I drew up some drawings. It's a, a drawing of a girl who has a bouquet and then the bouquet flowers are all like a star shaped, <laughs> but looking out the big window and there is an, an earth rising in the background. So that was it, very simple. Um, so enter that in and I got selected or I got, you know, a, a prize for it. And then the award was, uh, I think it was like probably $500 um, if if it was a dollar is a, is to a yen, right? Mm -hmm. Wait, a dollar to hundred yen. Anyways, <laughs> it's about $500. Mm -hmm. um, and also that the, the, the first Japanese astronaut, Dr. Mamoru Mori, would take my drawing with him on the space shuttle Endeavor to space, and uh, that's that's that was it. Wow, that's yeah. amazing! Right, <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, so I haven't been to space, but my drawing has. But your, your drawing has. That's that's yeah. incredible. And of course, I got this little um, like a plaque uh, mm -hmm. with my drawing, and then the certificate from. Uh, NASA saying like this object has been thrown to space and then we certify that. <laughs> That's so cool. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you, sorry, go ahead. Do you, do you still have the drawing? Do you still have the plaque I do. somewhere? I do. All right. Yeah. Very I'll cool. send a picture later. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Yeah. 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 So then because of that, right, um, I, my name and address was on the database of who like a people who was managing those events and mm -hmm. later the same same year there was a uh, international conference uh oh i can't remember anymore asia pacific international space conference or something right and that and i was i got a letter of invitation to participate in it but i was like 15 or whatever right i was like it's probably a mistake, but I got invited. So, and it just happened to be at the hotel 15 minutes away from my school. <laughs> so then I talked to my, my teachers and say like, is it okay if I ditch my classes and go attend this thing? Right. <laughs> and again, this is the, um, uh, private Catholic girls only school, right? Okay, right. And then they were like, oh, oh, okay, well, your drawing has been to space. And so, and it's only 15 minutes away, I guess you can. So I said, okay, I just <laughs> see you. <laughs> and went to this conference with my school uniform. So of course I stand out, right? Like there are people with like suits and tie and like all businessmen there. Right. And then like there goes a schoolgirl with a uniform just walking down the hallway. So I got lots of attention. 
<laughs> right? And then, uh, so I, uh, one of them, like, you know, talked to me and like, why you're here? And I, I, I told the story and it's like, oh, would you like to meet the first Japanese astronaut, Dr. Mamoru Mori? I'm like, I would be happy to. Yeah. So I get to meet him, right? And I, mean, I, I actually have this on my, this is when I, when it happened. Oh, that's so cool. Right? That's so wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uniform and yep. everything. Goodness yep. gracious. Yeah. Right. So then I talked to him and then, you know, I asked one important question, right? Um, so I, because of the drawing and he knows the drawing, right? I am wonder, I, I, I'm wondering if I should pursue science or art um, in college and my as my career. And his answer was, why don't you do both? Because there will be a day that artists or um, actually anybody can go to space and you know create something that couldn't have been created without that experience. So I said, okay, that sounds good. And that's when I decided to go study science. <laughs> the reason oh, is God. because I thought that I would probably need very fresh young brain to understand complex concept of science, right? Uh, but art, I could um, say a, a, a keep, I guess, a um, heart for it or aesthetic sense for it in my everyday life. There's actually a beauty in science too, right? So I was like, maybe I can just hold that to I could you know deeper in my heart while I, I pursue my science career, and then when the chance comes, then I can you know that you know exercise my aesthetic or the the artistic creative part of things. So so that's why I decided to go on science. <laughs> that's really cool. That's really cool. So yeah. have you have you kept with your have you kept with your art through through the years? Like have art? you continued to yeah. Yeah, so um, I I think to a small scale, I mean, like I kept drawing, I do um, like knitting, sewing, baking. I do extensive baking. I did extensive baking and nowadays I don't have time, but I make sure to take a day or two off before my son's birthday and make a, a, a very elaborate birthday cake for him every year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so you you're at this conference. You you meet you meet this astronaut. You take this. You take this photo. He says, "Okay, can pursue science, pursue art." Where do you go from there? Do right. you? Right. So that was Japan, and right after that, my dad got an assignment to move to Silicon Valley. And so I left Japan with my family to come here. Mm. Uh, but again, you know, I knew that I had to leave my Catholic school, <laughs> you know, to if I were to study art or science anyways. But so in a way, the move didn't scare me at all in a way. Right. Um, and I knew if I were to study space, Japan wasn't known for aerospace back then that much. Mm. Right. Um, I mean, it's we we did have JAXA actually. JAXA used to be called NASDA, NASDA. Uh, mm -hmm. So we had the space agency, but you know, the US is like NASDA and you know all of that. So like you know, perfect. I'm just gonna go with them and be fine. So so we moved here, and uh, I would say my family stayed here for like a year and a half to two. But that's around the time that I start started college. Uh, and so uh, I, uh, long story short, I went to um, a junior college, the community college, and then on to second half of my undergrad was at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Well, how, how did you, how did you find the difference between, you know, the way that uh, the, the growing up with, okay, Growing up in Tokyo, where you could barely see the night sky, to now the Bay Area, well, did you start getting into astronomy? Did you start, you know, appreciating it out here? Or tell them? Yeah, you know, um, when first when we first arrived at Cupertino, <laughs> right? I mean, 
mean, Cupertino is, in, you know, tech center, you know, a city, heart of Silicon Valley, right? So there's yeah, the yeah. tech company and Apple, you know, all, all of that here, but then there are mountains. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, there are mountains. I'm like, wow, where are we, <laughs> right? <laughs> and mm -hmm. also my class, um, in Japan was 120 girls per class, right? Or, or per the yeah the class of yeah yeah class right? Uh, but here in public school, there's like 450 people, right? <laughs> Girl and boys, and like these are the people who like uh, show up in like move Hollywood movies and stuff, right? So I was like, oh my God, <laughs> where am I? <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So that was uh that was shocking. Um <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. So and so how did, how did you like Berkeley? Did you continue your space enthusiasm right. there? Like, tell me. Tell yeah. Me so when I was at Berkeley, I studied physics. Part of the reason I studied physics is number one, Berkeley didn't have aerospace engineering. They had mechanical engineering. And by the way, Berkeley just started aerospace program, I would say two years ago. So it's kind of new. Yeah. Um, and but so I studied physics because I was interested in gravity. So but after I studied, you know, physics at Berkeley, I found out like, oh, my God, it's so hard. <laughs> And I'm not that theoretical, right? Um, I did um, had an internship at Space Sciences Lab and looking into uh, spectral analysis of distant stars from the like observatory data somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I did that. Uh, but uh, what happened after that is that I think it was the senior year at Berkeley. I took an interdisciplinary class called uh, Mars by 2012. <laughs> um, okay. We're 2023 20, and we are not there yet. But anyways, the, the idea <laughs> is like, if we were to go to Mars by 2012, then mm -hmm. what should, what has to be true, right? Mm -hmm. That could be um, habitat or uh, communication because Mars is you know, pretty far away. So it's you know, you've seen Martian, it, it takes like forever until, yeah, you know, you yeah. get the answer, right? Um, and then the team that I just happened to pick was countermeasures team, because there is, uh, there are lots of physiological negative effect on human body in microgravity environment. Yeah. And so I was like, that's interesting. May because I was interested in gravity, I, you know, that was a kind of like, aha for me. And also, oh, maybe if there is no gravity and have all of those negative effects, why don't we create gravity artificially and see how it goes? Um, but NASA has done extensive study in 80s, I would say, on artificial gravity and basically said, no, nope, it's too too much, you know, hassle, too expensive and, and all of that. So they kind of shelved it. But then I think I hear that like that argument is coming back in the past 5, 10, 15 years or so. I haven't been following, but back when I was, you know, doing this, you know, they were pretty much like, now nah, we are not going to do countermeasures. Oh, sorry, uh, the artificial gravity. Instead, the countermeasures are all, um, you know, everything that you can do, like take a pill or do exercise, but what kind of exercise, uh, you know, the, so all of that stuff. And I thought that was fascinating. Um, and so that helped me to think more about um, the physiological effects uh, of microgravity environment, particularly interested in bones, because, you know, as you can see, physics, <laughs> I studied physics, right? <laughs> Biology is something that I did not want to study <laughs> because it's just, I don't know, like I felt that biology is so, lots of memorization um, while physics is straightforward. Like if you push something, it just moves towards that direction forever, right? Like it's pretty straightforward. 
Um, yeah, yeah. No, for, uh, sorry. If you push it, it won't move towards uh, forever. It depending on friction and whatnot. But my, you know, my point is, it's more intuitive to me than just the pure memorization. So, um, but I, so I picked bones because uh, it's pretty much rigid, <laughs> right? And also, it's. I felt like bone is like a um, like a column in the building. It's a supporting mechanism for a body. And then again, because it's rigid and like very tangible, that I not like cells and ATPs and photosynthesis or whatever. That I, it's much easier for me to understand. So I got interested in bones then. Um, and uh, so, but around the time it's a senior, so I was. I graduated, right? And uh, and I was like, okay, physics and astrophysics isn't for me because it's too theoretical. So I have to do something more, I guess, um, hands-on. That means engineering. And then since I was interested in space program, I should study aerospace engineering. Um, and so that's uh, that's why I went to San Jose State University to study aerospace engineering. Um, so I did that for a while. Uh, and during that time, I found, um, again, the internship at NASA Ames Research Center. And this is a, a lab called Muscle Skeletal Biomechanics Lab, um, led by Robert Whalen. And there was a, a, also a grad P, a Stanford PhD student, Tammy Cleek, in there. But they're basically studying you know, bone loss in space. So I was like, perfect. You know, that's what I was interested in. And, um, and but in order to study bone loss in space, you need to be able to look at what is, what was it before and what was it after. But if it's, it's bone, you can't dissect the astronaut. <laughs> so that means you have to use medical imaging like X-ray or MRI to take yeah. a snapshot and then before and after, right? So they were pretty much interested in, at that time, how to do that. Um, one way to do it uh, that they were working on is using DEXA machine, so dual X-ray absorptometry machine uh, that's used widely for a uh, osteoporosis diagnosis nowadays, right? So we had an access to the DEXA machine at VA hospital in Palo Alto, and so, and then, so the Tammy Cleek, the PhD student then, her dissertation was around how mechanical, different type of mechanical loading affect bone shape. So we studied many, um, uh, I guess, subjects, and they are sedentary control, soccer player, and long distance runners. Because if you look at uh, how the uh, long distance runner, like they, I mean, soccer player and, and long distance runner, they run about the same, same amount, right? More or less. But runners only go straight. While soccer players will have like, you know, side cut or sometimes going backwards. So they, their loading pattern is more, I guess, well-rounded in a way, right? So we were using this DEXA machine to understand the shape of the tibia. So that's your shin bone. Uh, and so, and then the, you know, the long story short is that the uh, long distance runner tend to have a, tibia is usually about like a triangular shape, mm -hmm. but long distance runner tend to have like more like an elliptical shape uh, towards the direction of their gait, right? while uh, the soccer player tend to have more rounded shape. And the long distance runner is known to have a stress fracture in their tibia because they load in one direction. While mm. that's not the case for a soccer player. Mm. Right. So these are the, the things that we were doing, but I know it's a little bit away from astronaut, but... <laughs> but well, uh, no, I mean, so many people, so many people assume that like, you know, we go out to space and it's just spit. It's just Earth, but you know, there's a different view out the window. But no, it's like we we have to consider the physiological impacts right. of having you know lower gravity environments, different different right. atmosphere environments. All yeah, no, please continue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then, essentially, um, so the 
in a way, soccer player and long distance runner is the loading difference in loading pattern and how that affects bones. But if you think about astronaut, it's removing all the mechanical loading, right? Mm -hmm. So then what would that what would that do to the bone? And then mm -hmm. we know from the studies, you know, in shuttle eras, right, that we lose bone, we meaning astronauts lose bones uh, three times faster than osteoporotic women. And uh, and also it's it takes three times longer than when you were in space to gain back that bone back, right? So it's a, a actually a very um, a big problem because if you um, you know spend millions of dollars to send astronaut to the moon and that that trip could be like some you know somewhere between half a year to a year. Right. Mm -hmm. And then once you get there, then you, I don't know, you know, trip over a stone and broke your bone. Right. Break your bone. That that would be like taxpayer dollar down the drain almost. So <laughs> <laughs> so that's why the astronaut and that's not the only reason why, but that's part of the reason why astronauts from space shuttle era to even the space station astronauts are required to exercise two hours a day. To keep their muscle and and car, you know and cardiovascular health as well as bones uh, to counteract that that's the countermeasures to mm -hmm. the bone loss and you know and muscle loss and all of that so um, and so basically we wanted to use DEXA machine and also looking at the using CT machine too to um, understand before and after of astronauts bone. Um, and but astronauts are very hard to come by. <laughs> so we were involved in um, uh, the what do you call it? The bed rest studies where you can get volunteers to lay on a bed for like months and months and study their bone loss. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yes, they do actually repeaters too. I, I found out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, so so that I was I was fascinated by all of that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So yeah. then, um, after a while, uh, I think around the around the time that Tammy, um, the PhD student, graduated, uh, my boss decided to retire. And so I was like, well, that's too bad. I don't know. I, I guess I should look for a new job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's when I found a, a researcher at uh, UCSF uh, who had a NASA grant to study bone loss in space uh, yeah. among astronauts. So uh, then I moved to UCSF and um, I, I think I was there for about a year and then entered into UCSF graduate program for bioengineering. So it's actually a joint program in bioengineering between uh, University of California, San Francisco and Berkeley. So it was very interesting program where it's one PhD degrees, but coming from two schools. Um, mm -hmm. And you could pick which, you know, uh, lab in, in, in either campus. I happened to pick the one at UCSF um, and uh, yeah, studied osteoporosis and X-ray medical imaging there. Very cool, very cool. Now, so from some of this, because you mentioned that um, astronauts lose bone mass like more dramatically than even you know people suffering from osteoporosis, have there been has any of your work been involved in some of these things where you know something that is studied for space comes back to earth and helps you know yeah. helps us work with troubles down here yeah so before going there in a yeah. way right the, yeah, yeah. sorry about that the <laughs> you, you're the captain of this ship I just... <laughs> so what's interesting i think what, when i was looking for uh you know to, to change from nasa ames to ucsf I noticed that, well, in the history of whole humanity, right, there have been like about what, 100, uh, no, sorry, 550 people who've been to space, mm -hmm. right? That's a small population. 
While there are millions of people here on Earth suffering from osteoporosis, right? Including my mom,、mm-hmm. right? And I'm like, well, okay, if I spend my PhD days, like four or five years,、um, studying that, then I get to be useful in those millions of you know, osteoporotic women as well as astronauts. So that's why I justify myself, like, okay, I'll, I'll go study some more. Is, is what happened. So, yes, so the, the osteoporosis is interesting. That's one of the、um, uh, kind of like, you know, peek into the conversation maybe later. But the、uh, pharmaceutical companies are the、um, heavy user of space experiments since. Um, space shuttle era. I mean, heavy user isn't probably a good word, but like they've been using microgravity e n v i r o n m e n t for drug discovery、um, or you know, formulation、uh, studies and all of that. And so the osteoporosis is a good one too, because in microgravity e n v i r o n m e n t you lose bone much faster. So、um, let's say if you were to test osteoporosis drug to see if it's effective at all. Right? You need to do the experiments for like two, two years, five years, maybe 10 years until you prove that this works. But if you do that in space, it's much faster. So you can see if this drug is working or not.、Hmm. So, the, the fam- I was a famous case. One of them is that it's,、uh, there's a drug called bisphosphonate, which is a, a common、uh, osteoporosis drug that was tested on astronaut too. Um, and uh, and there's, you could also send mice to space to study、uh, the effect of microgravity on the bone. And there's lots of parallels that you can draw from the findings of that. So it's a mechanical unloading, right?、Mm. Uh, of course, the osteoporosis is way more complex because there's age factors and what, whatnot.、Uh, but at least you know,、uh, by doing experiments, With mice in space around you know, how the bone is、uh, changing in unloaded condition, then there's lots of、uh, you know, insights that we can draw from it.、Hmm. And th- this, was, this was kind of the stuff that you were working on. You're like working on these studies that. Well, I'm. I'm... So, okay. So,、uh, I have so many questions and I'm really <laughs> trying to concentrate on your. So, you're, you've gone to UCSF, you've gone down this route of, okay, you know, these are things that are not only comparable for the millions of people suffering from bone loss down here on Earth, but also this、uh, astronaut science. Where do you go from there? Yeah. So,、um, after I graduated from UCSF,、um, I got a job at a、uh, company. Called Synarch, which has been、um, acquired, by, acquired by different you know, companies. So they, they changed the、passed、name. Passed around, yes. Yes, yes passed around.、Um, but、uh, regardless, these are the clinical research o r g a n i z a t i o n that help、um, pharmaceutical companies to run clinical trials. So、mm-hmm. I got hired as product manager first, but then became scientists right after and uh, helped uh, on many.、Uh, Uh, uh, drug trials,、hmm. especially on、um, muscle skeletal systems. So、hmm. I, over, I, was, I, I oversaw many of、um, arthritis drug trials, some osteoporosis, medical devices.、Uh, yeah, and then working with major pharmaceutical companies on that. And, and during this time, I'm sure you're keeping your eye on, okay, you know, if there's been more research into low gravity、uh, bone loss, et cetera, you just, you know, once in a while you, you stay in touch, or did, had, did you have a group of astronauts that were your friends at this point and you、yeah. just call them up and say, hey, you know, how are you feeling today? No, you know what? Actually, around that time, of course, I was still interested in space, but、mm-hmm. not as active. Okay. Right. I think, well, one thing is to, to kind of focus on the, my work, right? And then the bone research and whatnot.、Um, but other part is it was an interesting time where, like, actually, this is a true story. I think it's around my master's degree, during my master's degree at San Jose State, right? 
-hmm. I went to talk to a, somebody, I don't even remember, uh, NASA Ames, and then like, oh, what should I do about my career? And then that was around the time that space shuttle was retiring, and then space station was about to start or, or it's halfway down construction or something like that. So, and this person, I don't know why, but I, I remember clearly that he said like, well, you know, um, the space station is halfway done and space shuttle is retiring. There's not much to aerospace engineering. And on top of it, he said that economically, even with the downturn, if the town downturn comes around the time, right? right? I mean, it was pre-2008, so, <laughs> right? Even the economy goes down, aerospace industry is safe because it's tied to military, right? So that it will, you will never lose a job, but then it's not like, you know, there are a lot to be done beyond space station, is what I was told. So that's I think that's probably, um, you know, was in my back of my mind to change the field to, to bones, mm -hmm. right? Life science. Maybe I think that there was a little bit of that, right? So then, so when I was at uh, the CNARC Bioclinical Claudio, it's multiple names. Um, uh, when I was there, um, again, I was focused on bones, uh, but at the same time, um, in a way, you know, I'm so glad to see that these drugs that come to us, right, um, for osteoporosis or whatever else, right, Tylenol included, um, are have gone through a very rigorous clinical trials to get to the market, right? Awesome. I'm so happy, but I felt that I don't have to be uh, the one. In you don't have industry. to be the person <laughs> doing those trials. Right, yes. Right. 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 <laughs> Right. Um, and then the, but so what happened was, I think all in all, I stayed there for about five years. Um, and then I had my son. And so my son was born and, uh, and then, you know, having a kid gives you lots of different perspectives, right, about life. <laughs> right. And, and that is also around the time that Elon Musk was started to get successes in, in his rocket launching, like reusable rocket launching. So it's things are getting interesting in space, mm. right? And then, so, uh, and then I was like, okay, well, you know, the bone field, I don't intend to stay for too long. Um, and uh, space is getting interesting. And I have this very unique combination of life sciences and space, aerospace. And I didn't know what to do with it, <laughs> you know, for a little bit, right? And yeah, I can get a job and do fine in clinical research with my PhD, that's fine. But then I felt that the other half, the space part, or the, the physics in the space part is not utilized fully. Mm. So um, I was like, okay, what should I do? Um, and because, you know, again, I had my son and I we put my son into daycare from when he was two and a half months old, right? Mm -hmm. And then the the those child care in the United States isn't cheap at all. So meaning I was like, well, if I were to pay somebody to have my son taken care of, right, then my work gonna mean a lot mm -hmm. to justify that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I started thinking, okay, so if I were to use full of my, I mean, all of what I've got, right? What would that be? And so, okay, then two things that came to my mind. One is that life science and space, it's a very niche field. But if you take a look at all the space-based experiments done to date from the space shuttle era to space station, right? Like majority, maybe half of it is is life sciences. And I, as I said, pharmaceutical company has been utilizing space 
you know, environment for their drug discovery and whatnot. So I was like, that's a very niche field that somebody like me could uniquely serve. Mm -hmm. That's one. The second thing I thought was, well, so I did physics, especially, you know, astrophysics using spectral analysis, right? I studied aerospace engineering and studied like how the, say, you know, satellite works and, you know, the, the weather satellite to Earth observation satellite and, you know, the source and blah, 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 right? So like that is spectral analysis, mm -hmm. right? And then I studied medical imaging using CT and X-ray. That's mm -hmm. spectral analysis too. So yeah. it doesn't matter if you are looking deep in, you know, the distant stars into the deep space or using satellite to look down on earth to understand the state of the earth right mm -hmm. or using medical imaging to understand what's going on inside your body it's mm -hmm. all the same thing to me mm. right so yeah, yeah. that that's when i was like oh maybe that i could use that to my advantage in a way like i you know it's true that i let my curiosity choose different discipline and it looks all over the place but so in other words it's after the fact <laughs> but i found a, a silver lining in a way right yeah. um and 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 so that's that's when i was like oh maybe i can take this to somewhere the, i mean that's wonderful that's what so is that how you ended up over at stanford no no that's how i ended up at the I, I, International Space Station National Lab. Okay. The K cases, the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, right? Okay, yes. Yeah, so it took me three years to land that, land that job though. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's a long road and then it's field. But essentially, so I got hired as the first uh, one in West Coast for cases International Space National Lab. Um, mm -hmm. So for a background, the uh, International Space Station is a U.S. national lab. Mm -hmm. In 2005, uh, U.S. Congress appointed ISS as such, as a national lab. In 2011, NASA selected CASES to be the sole manager of the national lab portion of the International Space Station. Um, so we have uh, half of the uh, up mass and down mass and the astronaut time uh, of NASA, so so is is for us to to I guess manage, right? Mm -hmm. So and I was in a business development team, so that means is that I go talk to researchers from uh, you know universities, research institutions, or other national labs, or or Fortune five hundred companies of all all sorts, or educators or even the startups to see if there is any uh, projects to be conducted in space station um, mm -hmm. that benefits our lives here on earth in some way so that was my job and yeah yeah so i mean you, you talk about being in charge of like the up mass and the down mass there's there's limited real estate in space. There's limited amount of you know things that can be done on in a twenty four hour day on the space station. How how do you how do you balance the various priorities, or how did you yeah. how did you think about because you know it's, a, it's an incredibly important resource. You know, You're especially right, right. since we don't have you know hundreds of space stations out there. There's only only the ISS now. There's the Chinese yeah. one, but like how. What are your thoughts on how we decide what our priorities are in off-world research? Right. Yeah, so we have a uh, procedure or mm -hmm. the rather uh, like a, um, the proposal process, right? Mm -hmm. And there are different things that we looked at. Um, mm -hmm. But like one thing I must say is that if you can do it in, in the lab down the street or down the hallway, do it. <laughs> it's much cheaper, <laughs> right? Um, in yeah, other words... Yeah, in other words, these are things that could only be done in space and utilizing something that, the three things actually, that space got to offer, right? The first one is microgravity environment. 
Second one is extreme environment outside of the space station. So, you know, uh, temperature cycling, like right? 100, uh, 200 degrees uh, plus and minus within like 90, 90 minutes, right? Um, yeah. And then the atomic oxygen, the auto vacuum, and even debris out there. So like it's great for material testing or if you have a sensor to test and how it might, you know, degrade because of, you know, all of the harsh condition, that's perfect. And then the third one is the vantage point, meaning that it's been, you know, 250 miles above and have a, uh, I think 90% of the um, populated area is covered, right? So there's great, it's a great Earth observation platform. So, um, so in other words, the project has to uh, utilize uh, any combination of these three. That's one must, right? And, and also ISS National Lab was focusing on benefit to our lives here on earth. And, and then people do get confused and I see why, right? Not, ISS National Lab is not NASA, although we are very close partners, right? Mm -hmm. But NASA um, have a, 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 like a focus on say, uh, keeping astronaut uh, al no, not just alive, but like well, right? But and healthy, yeah, right? Yeah, Maintaining yeah. their uh, health, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe those are things for future, like exploration going to moon and Mars mm -hmm. uh, or um, other, uh, like uh, maybe some astronomical experiments or something, you know, all, all of that. So they have their own set of uh, research topics, right? Uh, but ISS National Lab is focused on working with the private sector, right? So that um, it's something that um, has somewhat like uh, commercial value, although we do STEM projects. So, you know, it's not, not necessarily immediately commercial value, but, you know, some, it has a commercial application or at least application in our lives here on earth, not mm -hmm. for exploration. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, so that's one big ex uh, distinction there. Um, and um, where was I going with that? <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh... so, so my, my, my initial question was, uh, how do you think about the mass off orbit and the priorities of oh, how yes. we decide? Thank you. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, thank yeah, you so much. And yeah. I, I swear, I, I, I also want to turn not only to like, you know, the incredible stuff that you've worked on, but how you view, you know, everything. Yeah, but, yeah. Let's, let's, yeah. Let's, let's finish this first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so, so that's, you know, it has to, there has to be a clear benefit to our lives here on earth. Um, mm -hmm. So those are the kind of very high level, very basic criteria, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course it has to be something that's, you know, feasible <laughs> in space because like, you know, if you want to send a giraffe to space station, like, sorry, it won't fit. Um, or if it's something that would like uh, explode, it's very hard to do it in space station. So there's some, you know, restrictions, but, th but those are operational restrictions, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, the, our mandate in a way is because ISS is, you know, put together with US tax money that we wanted to show the return of investment to taxpayers and, and, and as such, it has to benefit, you know, our lives here on earth. So, so that that's that's a very big big um, you know criteria, yeah. Excellent, excellent. So now I, I do want to I want to switch back to to you, not only your work. Okay. So, would you ever go to space? I would if I can you come would. back. If you can come back, okay. Right. Yes. Is there a place that you would want to visit? Is there a because you're you're someone who knows more than many people what that actually means, what's involved in getting you know people and mass and all those things yeah. off world? Yeah, I would like to go to ISS because it's something that I worked on worked on, but I never be. <laughs> it's like you know remote work forever. <laughs> <laughs> remote work forever. 
Yeah, I mean, I haven't that, even touched the product I was selling. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that, yeah, no, that that makes sense. So have you, uh, you know, seen or talked with people that have been up to the ISS? I, I assume you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I do know many astronauts uh, because you know, kind of comes with the. It's a perks that comes with the line of work that I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Very cool. So I. So let's let's say you're you're up on the ISS. Are you interested in like doing doing experiments or seeing how things are, or just looking out the window and seeing seeing the Earth or yeah, seeing uh, into the cosmos? Right, right. <laughs> um, I think I just want to experience the microgravity. You know, I just want to feel that. Right, mm -hmm. that's one thing. But I, if I don't have to worry about you know, like tasks and all, <laughs> then I want to look out in the window and see the earth and then the, the deep sky, uh, deep, sorry, deep space as well, because it doesn't twinkle, right? Mm -hmm. No atmosphere, there's it doesn't twinkle. Um, but I one thing I want to do, and that probably will, you know, kind of bring us to the what I'm doing now in a way, is that uh, I, I want to do, if I, I, I want to use my personal time to do, uh, something artistic. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that may be just like looking at it, like staring at the earth, like forever, but then that would, you know, imprint some impression or emotion or something in me. Right. Hmm. Uh, so I may not be making something on the spot, but that experience is important to me. Yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned cooking. Maybe you bake the first cake in, in the ISS or something. I yeah. don't know. Did you know or, that the, the the chocolate chip cookie has been made in space? I, I read that, yes. Have they have they stuck with cookies? Are they going to more, are they doing baked Alaskas or anything more complex? Or? I don't know. I don't think so. At least I haven't heard that yet. Okay. But it's awesome. But I would that, like that... to eat. A, you know double tree hotel chocolate double uh, chocolate chip cookies in space yes <laughs> yes that, that would be quite the experience that would be quite mm -hmm. the experience so are there things because one of the things that a uh, part of this whole project is you know some people are perhaps in in a space where where you mentioned you were where you're doing you're doing the research you're you're staying with things you have kind of a vague interest in space but it took a couple of things in your life to kind of make the jump back in make the yeah, yeah. you know make that that uh that change of course so to speak um do you have any uh suggestions for people that might be in a comparable a comparable area of their life where you know they're kind of interested but they're not sure if that's kind of their space that's kind yeah. of their industry yeah, I, well, for, I mean, I, I speak for space, but I mean, it's probably true for other disciplines too, but I kind of feel, especially it's pretty clear in space, like it, there's like a notion where if you're interested in space, you have to study aerospace engineering, mm. but I think that's no longer true. Right. Mm. As I, and I'm coming from life sciences, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a place for it. Right. And then like ISS National Lab too, there are like marketing people, lawyers, or uh the material science scientists, or there's actually one uh veterinarian astronaut too. But um what I'm saying is that I think it could um I think you could aerospace and especially as we have more and more commercial activities in space, right? Uh, we need a lot more talent than just the aerospace engineers, right? It's good to have that technical knowledge, but then it takes a village to do something, right? It takes people from many different disciplines to make this, um, I guess, robust or, um, uh, yeah, robust, space economy to happen so mm -hmm. and i feel that uh, from my experience um being knowledgeable about adjacent areas mm -hmm. or seemingly distant thing but like having a more holistic or systems level viewpoint of the thing right 
uh, is important and you know humble you to a degree too. But at the same time, I think um, yeah, know that there are lots of things have to happen for a rocket to go, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that kind of viewpoint is very important. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm I'm kind of happy that I you know went on a like a little side path of bones. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and and you you make a really good point, Leslie. Yeah, people, we're gonna need all kinds of different talents, all kinds of different perspectives, all kinds of different knowledge bases in order for it to actually not just be you know, a couple people at an outpost in order to actually have, you know, off-world life, not yeah. just you know, off-world research and not off-world um, exchange programs or whatever you want to call it. Excellent. Yeah. Well, so I, I know that, uh, so you mentioned that um, you're working on this class at Stanford. Yes. Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Is, is yeah. this because, you know, <laughs> is this part of what you're doing is, you know, yeah. Going yeah. to students that yes, you can you can also see yourself right. all home. Yeah. Right. So um the basically, so after I left ISS National Lab a year and a half or so ago, um, mm -hmm. I've been kind of like uh I guess you know exploring my next step. Mm -hmm. Uh but one of the direction that I'm looking at is uh I think I wanted to practice and lean in, lean in, understand more, uh, and uh, practice human-centered design, design thinking. Mm. Uh, because I guess in a way I felt that is uh, lacking from current aerospace field. I'm not saying zero, but they could use more of it is what I'm saying, right? Mm. I mean, we've, we proved that we can build infrastructures. We can mm -hmm. send people to space and sustain human for 23 consecutive years. You know, okay. we've done that. And I'm sure we can build moon base and you know, go to Mars and stuff with people. Like I'm not, I, I don't have any doubt about that. But I think we have to, if we were to think about more vibrant space economy or the economy that the space is more and more part of our you know the overall economy right then we need to understand uh and consider all the humans involved like throughout the 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 uh you know the chain but also the end user like how does it help our lives here on earth kind of a, 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 it's the important part and I don't know if we um, do enough job of communicating that or considering that right um, like the osteoporosis drug or uh, you know I don't think not not too many people are aware that the space had uh, a play in it. I mean, because of course, because like as long as the drug works, in a way, who cares that they went there? But anyway, I mean, you can cut that part. <laughs> you know, but but you see what I mean. I, it's but I, I think if we bring in human component to this, I think that's a key to more vibrant space economy. And so that's why I wanted to lean into that. But also at the same time. That's probably true for other innovations, um, right? Um, the quantum computing or um, even AI or, uh, you know, all of that new and upcoming emerging technologies. Technology is awesome and happy. And then I think there will be lots of application, but like, let's make sure that the end user is in consideration, right? Um, I think... That's important. That's all. that's why I'm kind of leaning into human centered design, design thinking. So what happened was right before COVID uh, pandemic hit in 2020 March, so like end of February time, um, uh, I was still with ISS National Lab, and there was an event at Stanford D School. So we brought in NASA, you know, astronaut and scientist, and uh, National Lab scientist, and had a big 
you know, whole day event of, you know, what is it like to be in space and experiments in space, you know, what has been done. Uh, but also in the afternoon, uh, you know, Seamus, which you already interviewed, um, did a workshop in the afternoon to, you know, have participants think about experiments in space, but also, um, you know, what if you do this experiment, what would be the outcome five years from that day uh, that you can read a New York Times front page, right? And yeah. that is very fun to think about, but also uh, fun to think about, but a very efficient way of thinking, you know, how the space-based research and your taxpayers' dollar is at work and changing your life on Earth, right? So again, that's like the whole thing about ISS Natural Lab. That was our mission. And then he was able to do that in three hours, right? I was like, this is brilliant and bringing human component to it, mm -hmm. you know? So so that's that's why I, I was uh, very, um, I guess, inspired by that event. And, and then the pandemic hit. <laughs> um, but so Debbie Seneski, myself and, and uh, Seamus, uh, we were pretty much saying like, you know, that event was great, but there's something to bringing human centered design, design thinking to hard science and technology, right? These are uh, kind of uh, again, I'm not saying it hasn't been done before, but you know, we there's a lot to explore in that intersection. So, so in the last three years, we three of us have been experimenting with that idea and did a little bit of like a, a like a um, a pilot sessions here and there, and finally it became a full ten weeks course this quarter at Stanford D School. Um, and then maybe Seamus and Debbie had talked about that much, or they've talked a little bit about it. And you know, it's, uh, if you'd like to talk about the course, that that is of course up to you. Um, or if you'd like to talk about you know how you communicate to people this whole idea of human-centered design in space. Uh, yeah, that, that, yeah, completely up to you. This, again, yeah. your attention. Yeah, well, again, I'm still like, you know, a, a early practitioner <laughs> in a way that like I may not be able to articulate too well, but I no, number one, I, I'm grateful that Stanford had, um, you know, provided me or allowed me to experiment with Seamus and Debbie, right? It's been a delight. Um, and uh, And I think it's very cool that we are doing that. and it's very fitting that we are doing at the Stanford D school because that's the center of human center and design design thinking and then mm -hmm. they care a lot about experiential learning radical collaboration with external you know partners and the real examples you know not just on a textbook but actually you know working with people who uh uh, uh, doing it as a everyday, you know, daily operation, right? Um, and and with students, and then they they are, uh, you know, quote unquote, next generation workforce. It's kind of mm -hmm. dry to say. I don't want to, you know, I, I don't necessarily <laughs> like that term, but uh, but like these are the people who are like going onto to the the society right after graduation, right? And I, I remember from my experience, yes, yes, I studied physics, like soup in a long equation that took you know, weeks and weeks to solve, right? But is it usable is it usable once I get a job? Not really, you know? <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. Good to have a theory done and then you know done ex you know those equations and whatnot and experiments, but uh, not really practical. So we are trying to make a class that we wish we had, <laughs> you know, fun, but practical uh, and useful. And so there, so this class is um, called uh, How to Shoot for the Moon. <laughs> Very fun title. And it's a co-listed is with the D school, but as well as Air uh, Astro Department because of Debbie. Debbie is from Air Astro, uh, but also positioned as an intro seminar. So in other words, 
um, it's for freshmen and sophomore who hasn't declared major yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then Seamus, um, cleverly, as he always is, name it a Flintstone class, not the Capstone class, because Capstone class tend to be, right? Like for seniors and graduating and whatnot, but this is like more foundational mm -hmm. and early stage. And like we would, of course, introduce to basic engineering principles, right? Uh, but also the design principles uh, and make sure that there's a human component to it. So mm -hmm. um, we have uh, three modules. And then the first module is uh, with City Institute, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And mm -hmm. they are, you know, they send uh, like uh, um, uh, planetary exploration probes and, you know, analyzing signals from the deep space and all of that. Um, but I mean, at the same time, they think about life, what it means, you know, what it, life means, like, why do we exist, right? Uh, those are very profound philosophical questions, right? Um, and so we are going to talk about like orbital mechanics and solar systems and whatnot. But if you can kind of uh, superimpose the human component to it, then it's a, um, you know, those freshmen and sophomores, they just came from the comfort of their home, right? And it's as if leaving a home planet and then started to see that there is moon, there's Mars, and there's outer planet, and then sun and other planet, and in, in, I'm part of big universe, right? And so I just grad, I, I just started the Stanford, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a little bit confusing, like there are so many smart people from all over the world and, you know, what should I do? What should I study? Like, what do I want to do with my life? Right. Uh, and then like, I want to do something, but I don't quite know what. And I hear, I see there are some things in my old, like distant orbit, right, uh, that I may catch on. Uh, but like, how would I think about this? Right. Um, and then, then the second module is where we get to partner with X, the Moonshot Factory. <laughs> and then we will talk to them about like, how do you decide what's worth Moonshot, right? Uh, like that could mean impact, but like how much sacrifice do I have to do? Is it worth it, right? Uh, how do you decide that? Like, how do you kind of vet through which ideas worth Moonshot? So we get to talk to them about that. And then the final module will be with uh, Blue Origin Orbital Reef team. They are you know, putting together a, a space commercial space station with other partners. Uh, and uh, But we want to have a final project where students can uh, think and design and, and um, pitch about their ideas of uh, functions to add function yeah function is a little bit interesting term but like to add to the orbital reef like say for example um, uh, if you want you if you want to say celebrate a diverse cultural background of people who gathered in that you know orbital reef right um, how should we do that? Maybe we can do it through food, uh, but if that's the case, we kind of need to have more, you know, um, more functions to kitchen, like being able to cook, uh, prepare, or you know, kind of table together. Although I don't think we need the the, the legs for the table because it's microgravity, right? What would that look like, <laughs> right? So that's one. Or maybe somebody will come up with uh, the maybe celebrate through music. If that's the case, uh, would all the instruments we have on Earth work? Or maybe, what if like, we gather sound of space? What the music be like, right? And then how do we, like, how, maybe we need a little room to gather together, right? And then so, so that then inform, you know, it, it will be a great um, thought experiment for Orbital Reef team to think about that. 
Uh, and it's so human, right? Because I mean, again, human uh, would be we we get to travel there, but also I'm, I'm also thinking about because when we say design, it tends to think about oh interior design, fashion design, like you know different colors, different shape, whatever. But I think if, uh, what I like about this field is that it's not something. It's designability is not just in a something tangible. Right? It could be in systems. Um, in other words, let's say if we were, again, going back to, if we were to celebrate diverse uh, cultural difference in people there, right? How do we um, invite others to come to space? That may not be physical thing. It could be policy. It could be how to reach those, say, say people in developing world and say, lower the cost of, you know, space travel, right? Th those are, there's designability to it, but not necessarily, you know, this can has to be pink, right? So, um, but I, so that's what I like about it. Um, and so students, uh, hopefully, you know, throughout the course, this is week two, <laughs> um, so we're still early, but that's like, that's, you know, we're gonna have fun and be able to work with, SETI, the X, and then the Brew Origin team about the tangible, like real e examples, not just in a, you know, pie in the sky kind of thing, and have the human component and design component, and also overlaying, right, that there's a mission to be done, but then you, this would be a part of your life mission too, right? And how do you think about that? No, um, so that, those are the things that we want to talk about in in our class. I mean, it it sounds it sounds fascinating, and that whole idea of you know, yes, it's this moonshot thinking, but it it can be applicable to people coming from any any areas. And how do you how do you work towards a goal? That it sounds incredible. It sounds good. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we've been going for over an hour now. Yeah, sorry. Now. Um. So I want to I want to be respectful of your time, um, but I want to make sure that we get. There is one question that I always ask at the very sure. end, which is, "What is the night sky like? Where are you based now? And what is the night sky like where you are? And has your journey up till this point kind of changed the way you look at the night sky versus way back when you were looking up at it in uh, Tokyo or <laughs> Nagano?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I'm in like heart of Silicon Valley, right? Um, there's some, it's, it's decent, <laughs> it, it's good, it's good, um, and I do occasionally step out and then look at the, um, night sky, um, I think sometimes there's, like, meteor shower that I want to catch, or maybe solar eclipse or lunar eclipse or something, but I think most often I go out there, to spot the ISS, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, there's, ISS have, uh, you know, uh, a space in my heart. I think sometimes I tell, I talk to my, uh, you know, dear friends at the ISS National Lab, like when the ISS comes down or decommissioned in 2030, I mean, that would be a big day for us, you know, for many, many people who's been, uh, involved in that uh, that mission, you know, for years and decades. Yeah, yeah. Well, I yeah, I imagine it. I imagine it will be bittersweet. So I I have to ask then. So are you tracking when the ISS is coming over? Do you do you see like okay, you know, you know it's going to be coming over at this time, or over the years have you just memorized that if wherever you are in the world, this is <laughs> this is what it's going to be coming? Like? No, no. No, no, there's actually an app for that. <laughs> I think it's called ISS Spotter or something like that. It's very um, easy to find. Uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe I can find. Oh, yeah, it says, yeah, ISS Spotter. Yes. <laughs> so you can set the um, the parameters, like, you know, your location, and you want to make sure that this is in an optimal viewing because you don't want it too low or too early when the sun's still out and stuff. So you can set the timer and then it will notify you like, hey, in five minutes, I guess this will be will come in your view. And um, I don't do that all the time, but like, you know, whenever I feel like it, I, I just go 
watch the ISS go by. Yeah. Oh, that is wonderful. That I, I think that's so cool. I think that's so cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that that's that's all I had, and I thank you so much for being a part of this and for sharing your story and for sharing your work. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been fun. Uh, yeah.